to your outline. The next major topic that is often asked about is the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And this is on page 548 of my edition. If you'll flip there, uh, if you have a different page, just find the ADA. And they go into a little bit of detail about the ADA. Again, in my book, it's 5-48. And essentially, they tell us, first of all, that from an employer point of view, this act kicks in when you have more than empl uh, 15 employees. And then secondly, the basic idea is, once this law kicks in, is that we're not allowed to discriminate in our employment practices uh, from anyone that has a physical impairment uh, that impedes a major life function is the phraseology here, and sometimes that's not extremely clear, and uh, probably a lot of this will be clarified as time goes on, but the idea is that if an individual is qualified to do a job and they are in some way uh, falling under the ADA, uh, we're not allowed to discriminate against them, and if we hire such a person, then we may have a positive responsibility to make reasonable accommodations for this person. We might need to alter their work schedule. We might need to modify a restroom, for example. We might need to take uh, accessible uh, materials or tools and place them within reach of an individual that was confined to a wheelchair, and that sort of a thing. And so that's essentially what the ADA is involved uh, or, or requires us to do. Uh, it also... Uh, indicates, for example, on 551 in my book, uh, that certain types of medical examinations and inquiries are allowed. Now, you'll notice later on in uh, your study of these laws that there is a federal law that says that pre-employment medical screenings are not allowed. But there is something of a fine line here. Certain types of medical exams uh, are allowed if there is a suspicion that these things may be necessary. And that's what's uh, indicated here. Uh, and you might expect to have one question from this ADA section. If you go back to your outline for a moment and then uh, jump back to the table of contents in your contractor's manual, uh, we're looking on 5-6 in my book. Uh, we see there are some other laws here. Uh, there's the Public Whistleblowers Act, the veteran, Veterans Reemployment Laws, uh, the Employment and Training Act, uh, Veterans Act, uh, and garnishment and so forth. And sometimes they ask questions about these acts, but essentially all you'll need to do is find out who it, uh, who it covers, uh, what does it cover, and what happens if you don't do it. The next topic on your outline is I, which deals with OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. And actually, you have three areas in your reference books, four really, that deal with OSHA um, in, in, the, in the main. The first area is the chapter that you're looking at right now, which is chapter five of your contractor's manual. The second area, of course, is Walker's Guide to Estimating. They also go into safety regulations. The third area is your uh, CFR 1926, uh, which is your actual OSHA regulation for construction itself. The odds are uh, that questions about OSHA are going to come from the Big Blue Manual first, and then if you can't find it here, it's probably going to be in your 29 CFR 1926. As we described earlier, the 29 means that it's an OSHA-related topic. The uh, CFR is where it's published. The 1926 is the specific law, which is construction OSHA. The next place that you're going to find information, and the primary place that you're going to find it, is also in the contractor's manual, but there's an entire chapter devoted to OSHA regulations. This is chapter number seven. So although all the regulations are summarized in chapter five, they are expanded upon in different areas, and OSHA is one of the main ones that's asked about and expanded upon. And you can expect to get four or five, uh, maybe even six questions about OSHA, so uh, you're going to need to take a closer look at it. Uh, if you would, uh, turn to Chapter 7 of your contractor's manual and look at the table of contents. Uh, you're going to find that there's a tremendous amount of detail here in the table of contents. And in a moment, we're going to take a look at a sheet that I hope will uh, give you the big picture of how OSHA works. But you also, in your outline, if you'll notice, you have a tremendous amount of detail in the outline of items that need to be addressed. And really, you could look at OSHA from... Uh, from two different angles. You could look at OSHA from the point of view of reporting requirements, and then you could look at OSHA from the point of view of technical requirements. And in the outline, I'm going to briefly discuss uh, some of the reporting requirements and technical requirements, and then we're going to take a look at an exhibit that you have in your module. We're going to go through in a little bit more uh, detail. 
first of all, essentially in reporting OSHA, it's required that contractors uh, keep uh, accurate records. And essentially the two main record uh, items that are kept are called the OSHA 200 and the OSHA 100 detail logs. Uh, the OSHA 200 is the main log and the 100 is the detail log. And uh, if you'll go along in the outline with me, that was topic 1A. Uh, B is the general duty clause. The idea here is that you're required to apply the OSHA rules whenever they're necessary. In this sense, OSHA is applied retroactively against events. And perhaps one of the reasons that individuals have a bad flavor in their mouth about OSHA is because it's enforced in that way. If you ask the question, what really is OSHA, what you'll find is an ultimate answer, is that it is the state-of-the-art technical rendering of the best way to do certain things. In one of our continuing education classes, we had a gentleman stand up, tell a rather interesting story. Uh, his group, well, he worked for the Navy on nuclear submarines at the time. His group wrote what are called the SCUBA, Self-Contained Breathing Apparatus Regulations for OSHA. And he described the process that they went through, which took many years, where first they came up with their suggestions, and then OSHA reviewed them, and OSHA sent them back to them for final review. And then once it got into the final review stage, there was a public comment period time, and then finally they were brought forth into regulatory status. But uh, what's interesting is that these regulations are really written by individuals in the industry and therefore they recognize they, they represent the best thoughts about how to do certain types of things in his industry for example uh, which was uh, building nuclear vessels and working with submarines, they had a peculiar problem and at the beginning of the day they'd send perhaps a hundred welders into the ships at the end of the day only 90 would come out what happened to the other 10 and they found out that often these guys would go to sleep in a compartment their buddies would weld them in so as an actual procedure, they had to go back through the ship at the end of the day and have somebody knock on every hull, on every door, finding out if anybody was lo locked in there and get them out. Uh, so that was something of uh, an interesting uh, rendition, but the important information is that these rules are uh, field created. They're created by individuals working in the field, and uh, they do tell us the best way to do certain things. Uh, if we look at OSHA that way, we'll find it a lot more palatable, and our work will go a lot better, and we'll also tend to help the people on our job by making job conditions safer. Now, because it's required whenever it's required, the issue of the logs become, become important, and when we get to the exhibit that you got, we'll look at the logs in a little more detail. Another responsibility is displaying posters, and everybody's responsible for this, but the GC, of course, has the primary responsibility if the subs don't follow through. We have time limits in this record-keeping process. We have to record the data in logs uh, no later than six days after an accident. We have to keep the logs current and at either a defined establishment or if we have many different establishments, we can have a representative copy on location at the mobile establishment. But we have to keep them current up to 45 days. We have to keep these records for five years, and if subsequent changes occur to the health of the individual first recorded in these documents, we have to update the documents to show the changes in the health of the individual for that five-year period of time. There is a stiff penalty if one falsely reports in these documents a $10,000 fine and possibly imprisonment. And the issue later becomes, well, under what circumstances do we actually have to record these items? And the two conditions here under I in your outline are the common denominator to what the big blue book goes on about for a number of pages. The two circumstances in which a record must be kept in the 200 log are, number one, the person goes under unconscious. Uh, that's in any case. And number two, anyone can administer first aid, a hospital, a doctor, even yourself. So where they went after the accident is not important, but what was done is important. And if what was done was first aid, and after first aid they can go right back to doing exactly the same thing that they could have done before uh, without the injury, well then it's not a recordable injury. You'll notice number J, in keeping records of lost work days, the day of the injury is not considered a lost work day. And number K, that if there are multiple hospitalizations or a death, we actually have to report within eight hours to OSHA. And number L, if citations are posted, we must list the citation and place it on the job site in the area where the citation occurred for at least three days or until the citation is corrected.
And then there's a series of calculations of how to figure out penalties in OSHA. Now you realize there are record-keeping penalties, and then there are penalties for technical violations. And of course, the more serious the violation in terms of health and safety, the larger the penalty. However, OSHA penalty ranges go from $7,000 to $70,000, or anywhere in between. And there is something of a formula for determining, first of all, a base penalty, and then adjusting that penalty for mitigating circumstances. Now, these are all listed in the contractor's manual, but the point is this. For the exam, if they want you to tell them what a certain penalty is, see if you can find the penalty literally expressed in the books. Don't try to take the formulas they give you in the books and calculate the penalty unless it's not listed. The odds are if they're asking you for a penalty, it will be expressly stated somewhere in the manual. If it's not expressly stated, then you may have to take a look at the adjustments and try to see how to figure the adjustments. But when you look this over, you'll see that it's really not that difficult because they're going to adjust it first for size and then for severity, and then also to see whether or not you had any good faith efforts on your part to mitigate the offense. Uh, number N, this is an administrative uh, bit of information. If you don't keep the records, there's a $1,000 fine. And then sometimes initial violations that are not serious are asked about, and on the outline, that's item O, and it refers you to your contractor's manual. And P talks about the adjustments I just mentioned. OSHA does want contractors to be aware of safety, and the idea is that a contractor ought to have, in fact, must have, a safety program. And essentially, a safety program, in reality, is going to consist of three things. And the first thing is training. Training is very important to OSHA, and we all have a responsibility to train individuals that are going to work with certain things, how to properly work with these items. But training isn't enough. We then also have to uh, follow up this training in some fashion. So really, the three parts of uh, any kind of safety program, uh, I didn't mention the first. The first would be recognition, to understand what it is about the work that we're doing that may be dangerous. The second is training. And the third, then, is to follow up in some way, to make sure that the training is effective and that individuals are following through uh, with the processes. Now, the next part of OSHA deals with technical requirements. And OSHA has many, many technical requirements, only some of which are listed in the outline. But the ones listed in the outline are the ones that tests like these tend to focus on. And so your task is to go through the outline and to mark the pages that are referred to and get familiar with how to find things in OSHA to find out what the technical requirements are. In this module, you have an exhibit that deals with OSHA that may help to see the big picture here of what's happening. Uh, and if you'll take that out and look at, uh, at it along with me, you'll see that this is referring to OSHA Chapter 7 and outlines the basic employer responsibilities. And the employer has four zones of responsibility, record keeping, construction standards, which I have uh, referred to as technical issues, the general duty clause, and then issues dealing with display. And you'll also notice at the bottom of this, there is a section that deals with some miscellaneous issues. And if you'll read through this along with me, I think it'll give you a pretty good idea of how this is all going to work. As far as uh, record keeping, we have the 200 and the 101 logs. We've already described that the 200 is the basic log, the 101 is the detail. We have six days to record information once it occurs with an accident that does not involve a death or multiple hospitalizations. For deaths and multiple hospitalizations, we're supposed to report within eight, eight hours. As far as what we're supposed to report, uh, if or what to record, uh, if they cannot return to work after first aid, it's a recordable incident. And of course, if they go unconscious, it's a recordable incident. Uh, these documents have to be current to within 45 days. We're supposed to keep them for five years. And a peculiar bit of information with this is that, let's say the individual subsequently gets further ill or actually passes away from something that was originally recorded on the document. Well, we have to go back and make a notation on the original document that subsequently uh, there was a, a, an injury or a, a, a consequence uh, that occurred so they can link the records together. Uh, we're supposed to keep these records in uh, locations that are easy to get to and the differentiation is made between businesses that have a main location and one that have mobile locations. Uh, and then if we have false statements there, there's a potential fine of uh, $10,000. Uh, if we do not keep the records, there's a potential fine of $1,000. For uh, multiple hospitalizations and fatalities, uh, we have to report within eight hours. 
uh, adjustments can be made to penalties, and the penalty ranges are seventy to $70,000. And sometimes there can be uh, injuries that are other than serious, and there's a listing of penalties and ways in which to calculate mitigating circumstances on penalties found at the pages that are listed here. As far as construction standards go, uh, the basic idea is that we're supposed to have a safe workplace uh, and that to make sure that this is so, that the inspectors have the right to enter a location to evaluate whether, that, whether it's safe. Your outline shows you much more detail here about uh, some of these issues, but I want to explain a couple of them to you. Uh, we have illumination. The issue here is based on a table and this table tells you how many lumens are necessary given a certain type of work. And every once in a while they'll describe a certain type of work and ask you what the illumination must be and it's based on that table. Similarly with sanitation, we need to have a, say, a, a number of commodes based upon a table. Uh, noise exposure, every once in a while they ask you to calculate uh, an, an excessive noise exposure level or determine if something is, is excessive. The basic idea here is that we're not allowed to be exposed to 140 decibels at any one instant. Now, decibel is simply a measure of noise. 140 decibels will damage the eardrums. The eardrums are sensitive bones that once damaged can't be uh, restored. A, an exposure to 140 decibels will injure these. To give you a sense of scale, a uh, handsaw uh, is approximately 120 decibels. And they actually have little meters that they can come out with and measure the decibel level. But even though we can't come into contact with 140 decibels for more than a period, for any period of time, we could come into contact with a lesser amount of decibel for a long period of time that would equate to the 140 decibel level. And there's a table that shows you how to, uh, how to determine whether an exposure equates. Now, this table's a bit involved. However, the easy thing to do is to notice that there's an example given right after that. And the idea is you're going to take each exposure level of a person and translate it into a fraction. And then you're going to add all these fractions up. And if your answer becomes less than one, then it's okay. But if the answer is one or more, then it's too much noise and there shouldn't be exposed to that level. Hazard communication, number five here, deals with uh, telling people that they're working with hazard uh, materials, hazardous materials, and relates to the MSDS sheet that was uh, refer to in your materials. Personal uh, safety equipment, head, hearing, eye, respiratory protection. Uh, as far as head protection goes, there are different types of helmets and most of this is common sense, but it's the common sense that's not that common. Would you want to wear a metal helmet if you were working around electrical wires? Uh, no, you wouldn't. Uh, you would not want to wear that type of helmet in that situation. Uh, as far as eye protection, there is a chart that shows you what kind of protection is necessary given a set of circumstances. And in terms of respiratory protection, there really are two levels of respiratory protection that we could refer to as the worst and the best. And then within the level of the worst, you could have the worst of the worst and the best of the worst. In the same way, in the level of the best, you could have the worst of the best and the best of the best. Well, the differentiation line, the point of differentiation between worst and best is whether it is a negative or positive air pressure type of approach. For example, the little mask that you put on your face, that's a negative air pressure approach. You're still breathing in air from around you. And so you could have the worst of the worst, which would be that little throwaway mask that you buy, or the best of the worst, which would be a full face mask with uh, filters on it. Now, these filters can... Uh, filtered out particles to a very small level. There are different filters for different purposes, and you can buy good filters that will uh, remove various chemicals. For example, uh, chlorine. Uh, I own dogs, and when I have to clean up the dog pen, I'll put a mask on with a filter on it that filters out not only them, but also the chlorine. But still, that's a negative pressure type of an approach because I'm still breathing in air from around me, even though I've got some good filters on there. Now, that type of uh, approach and that type of material or, or tool requires care and handling. It requires to be stored properly when you're not using it. If it's a more uh, involved mask situation, you're supposed to clean it uh, right before you use it. You're also supposed to test it to make sure it's fitted properly. In the category of the best, you have uh, positive air pressure. You're bringing air in from the outside. And this type of an approach will range from a small face mask 
that is, has uh, little oxygen canisters in it to a full moon suit where you're removed from your environment and you have supplied air coming in from a hose with a little tank for safety purposes in case your supplied air breaks or has a knot in it or something like this. So respiratory protection is a full gamut type of activity. Safety nets, uh, scaffolding, uh, lifelines, this is all very much focused upon in OSHA and uh, you want to take a look at your outline and make sure that you note when you need these things. Whenever you go above uh, 10 feet, uh, you need to have some sort of a safety plan. Uh, if you're in a low slope roof for residential construction, you can use an alternate plan. Otherwise, you're supposed to have some sort of, sort of formal fall protection from anyone over that distance. A person at any level is not supposed to fall more than six feet. And then it's a question of how uh, the nets are supposed to be uh, lined up, how strong they're supposed to be, what's the size of the mesh, uh, how the lifelines are supposed to be set up, what is the breaking strength minimums of the line itself, the attachment to the body, and then the fastening uh, clips and so forth used with them, uh, scaffolding, how it's supposed to be erected, how far away it's supposed to be from the building, how it's supposed to be secured. And all these things are going, gone into in great detail, as you'll see from the outline. Fire protection, there are different types of uh, fire devices, uh, extinguishers, A, B, and C. There's a chart, but the idea is you want an all-purpose fire extinguisher. Some fires, uh, like electrical fires, cannot be, uh, uh, you're not supposed to use a wa water on an electrical fire, and for that reason, you don't want to use the type of uh, fire extinguisher that wouldn't match with electrical fires. For practical purposes, just buy an A, B, C uh, fire extinguisher. Prevention signs, uh, these have to be certain, uh, like caution and danger, have to be certain colors. There are rules about the storing of materials, particularly the stacking of blocks, the stacking of bricks. There are rules about hand tools, particularly guards on hand tools. Power tools, particularly guards on power tools. Uh, positive switches on power tools. Uh, those type of pneumatic tools like uh, fasteners and nailers, they have to be set up so that they have to come into contact with the surface before they'll actually fire. Uh, scaffolds, something we have talked about before. Cranes, material hoists, and excavations. Uh, with excavations, we note that if it's four feet deep, you need a way out. If it's over five feet deep, OSHA rules apply. If it's over 20 feet deep, you need a professional engineer to design the system. And then you have appendices that relate to soil types as you're dealing with uh, these types of excavations and these OSHA rules. And you'll also remember that there, the CRAM uh, workbook is important here for calculating the volume of an OSHA pit. Stairs and ladders, the rules for handling these things, and general rigging and safety. All of these are construction standards. All are gone into in pretty good detail, uh, but are fairly easy and straightforward to find. You can expect to have three or four questions out of construction standards on the exam. The general duty clause, we're supposed to provide a safe workplace, and when is something necessary, whenever it's necessary. As far as display occurs, everybody is responsible. If there is a common area, the GC is responsible. Uh, if other people do not comply, it's the GC's responsibility. And citations must be posted at or near the workplace for at least three days. Miscellaneous provisions here under OSHA. The day of injury is not considered a lost work day. Failure to give advance notice to employees can be a $2,000 fine. And that's so that the uh, inspector can interview these employees. And if these employees want to be there and have anything to say, they can prepare their thoughts. Three, failure to abate the penalty can be a daily penalty up to 30 days. There are 10 components of a listed safety program as indicated in big blue. Uh, rope issues and safety factors we've discussed before, a safety factor of five for materials, ten for people. So if the rope will break at a thousand pounds, we can use it to lift 200 pounds of materials or 100 pounds of uh, small people, I suppose. Uh, number six, knots and bends reduce rope strength by 50%, hitches by 